Center's webinar, From Arrest to Homecoming, Addressing the Needs of Children of Incarcerated Parents. We are delighted to see the turnout today and uh, look forward to hearing your questions as we go along throughout the webinar. My name is Margaret DeZerga. I'm the Director of the Family Justice Program at the Vera Institute of Justice. As the Chair of the Reentry Resource Center's Committee on Family and Communities, I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today. The webinar is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. On behalf of the Reentry Resource Center, I'd also like to thank the Annie E. Casey Foundation for their leadership and support on this issue. As many of you probably know, the Annie E. Casey Foundation helps ensure that policymakers and practitioners are aware of the needs of children of incarcerated parents and that policymakers and practitioners have access to the tools needed to make a difference on this issue in their communities. So many of you have already found our uh, Q&A box. I wanted to let you know that if you encounter any technical or audio problems during the webinar, you'll have to call WebEx technical support, uh, and the number is in that chat box. In the event you have any issues during the webinar and are unable to participate, we'll be posting the event on the Reentry Resource Center website in a few days. You can find all the materials there. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Um, we have two presenters, Deanne Newell and Yali Lindcroft. Deanne is the founder and executive director of the Arkansas Voices for Children Left Behind an organization that has been instrumental in the development of state legislation to support subsidized guardianship by relative caregivers for children of incarcerated parents. Her organization has also worked on legislation to protect pregnant mothers during incarceration. So Deanne will bring her experience in Arkansas, as well as the experience she's had providing technical assistance to 14 states around the country on policy and program development related to children of incarcerated parents. Yali Lincroft is an independent consultant with the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the American Humane Association, and First Focus. She will be drawing on her work with the San Francisco Children of Incarcerated Parents Initiative to improve child welfare services, as well as her experience working on state and federal policy all around the country. So to give you a sense of uh, the outline of our presentation today, We'll provide you some background on children of incarcerated parents, discuss some of the complexities between the children, parents, and other caregivers, and offer you some practical tips and examples of how jurisdictions are working to support children of the incarcerated. After hearing from our presenters, there'll be some time for a Q&A session at the end. So to ask a question, you'll just type, the, type in your question into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar, and we'll leave time at the end to address as many as we can. I'd also like to just take a minute to mention an upcoming webinar on October 4th that's going to focus on family engagement strategies within the juvenile justice arena. Um, you can expect more details on that event from the Reentry Resource Center. So to get a better sense of our audience and to help you all get a sense of who's on the line, we have a quick poll. Um, we're interested to know what best describes where you work. So you'll see on the right-hand corner of your screen, on the right-hand side of your screen, a couple different options that you can choose, either inside a prison, in the community with justice-involved individuals, or perhaps you're not interacting directly with incarcerated individuals or their families, but you're working with those agencies that do. So go ahead and pick the option that best describes where you work. From what we could see from the registration list, we've got people on the call from all around the country who are working inside correctional facilities, some people coming from academia, others from foundations, and others still who are working directly in the community with families. So 
how did we do, Sean? Did we get a sense of our poll answers? Um, yeah, we did. Um, it doesn't break them down by percentages for me, but the overwhelming uh, response was uh, the second. What was it? the second response? No one in the community with justice involves individuals. Um, is, it looks like about half of the audience, I and mean, then uh, the other two, uh, 25%, basically each inside a prison jail, and uh, the last option, 25%, also selected that they don't inter uh, interact directly with incarcerated individuals. Okay, great. So we've got a real diverse audience, and thank you all for participating in the poll. So let me turn it over now to Yali, who's going to give us some more information on the number of people we're referring to when we talk about children of incarcerated parents. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. And I am thankful for, for this opportunity to talk to everybody um, about a very important issue for um, Annie Casey Foundation and some of the work we've been doing. I'm going to start off with some facts and figures, which um, some of these are relatively recent. And, um, and I think for those of you who work in the community, even more importantly, um, you, you see it and you live it. Um, so these are just general statistics. They're available. Um, at the Council of State Government, and in, when Mark refers to further resources later, she'll talk about a report that does summarize a lot of this, but also the NEA Casey website. If you go to www.aecf.org, and then there are search engines, say, Children of Incarcerated Parents, there's at least seven or eight publications that we distributed on um, children of incarcerated parents, including one-page fact sheets and um, summary reports. Helpful things for those of you who have finished writing your grants or are about to write your grants, <laughs> um, I hope. And then also, I'm currently working on a toolkit for social workers on this issue. So, probably more familiar um, on all these data recently, given that I'm sort of drowning in reports and papers right now. But just some general stats. What do we know about incarcerated parents? Well, we know that more men are incarcerated than women, 1 in 18 versus 1 in 89 women. However, we also know that within the last 10 years, the number of incarcerated women have increased higher percentage-wise. And what that means for those of us who are doing service work is as more women are becoming incarcerated, many of the children live with the mothers, and therefore we are starting to see much more of this population of um, children with their primary caregiver being incarcerated. And, um, and this is influencing, I think, the policy discussion is influencing the service discussion. This is not to say that fathers who are incarcerated aren't a very important issue as well, but I think one of the things for those of us who are looking at this work much more on the policy side of it, I think the trend of women's incarceration is one of the reasons why we're seeing much more of the dialogue about children coming up to the forefront. We also know that when, um, an, when a child has an incarcerated father, chances are they're living with their mothers. But if a child has an incarcerated mother, they're more likely to live with a grandparent. So one of the things this webinar will focus on is what I call the three-legged stool of the work. You, you can't just focus on the child and the parent. The caregiver is a very important um, leg of the stool of making the relationship work during the period of incarceration as well as reentry. What we also know about children of incarcerated parents is that there's great racial disparity issues, that one in 15 black children have a parent in prison, one in 41 Hispanic children have a parent in prison, and one in 110 white children have a parent in prison. Uh, this comes from the 2008 Bureau of Jur uh, Justice Statistics number. Um, of course, what we don't have here, but I think those of you who do this work know much more about it, um, probation numbers and, and disprepar disproportionality. Um, there's also no step-parent relationships. Um, there's all sorts of different configurations that um, influence the population we're working with. But this is the stats we have um, right from the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, we also know that uh, many of these uh, children will report have never visiting with their children during their incarcerated parent, um, period. Um, and as we talk further in this webinar, there's many factors on why there is um, no visitation, whether that is distance, whether that's a uh, relationship with um, the child and parent, uh, cost, uh, stigma. I mean, there's a lot of things that are in the statistics here. And again, we'll go into this further in the webinar. And then finally, we know that um, 
and this comes from a relatively new study. And in fact, one of my colleagues at the California Research Bureau um, just recently published one is um, for the children in the child welfare system, well, we're finding out that many of them, this is not the parent's first time being incarcerated, and this is not the child's first time being in the foster care system. Um, one of the things I get asked a lot because Annie E., um, the particular project I work on is child welfare reform, is what's the number? What's the number of kids in the foster care system that have a parent that's incarcerated? And I have to tell them that I have some studies, but I don't have a lot of studies because neither of them are static. I mean, a parent can be in and out of jail, in and out of prison, just like a child can be in and out of, um, of child welfare. Um, and so you have these two populations that are moving target, if you will. But when we do a point in time sort of look at it, generally what I've seen from local jurisdictions like San Francisco, New York, and others that have collected data that I trust, is somewhere between about 10 to 15 percent. And again, I think this number probably is underreported because we're not talking about the step-parent relationship. We're not talking about the probation issue at all. We're not talking about how incarceration also influences other things, such as placement, potential placement with a relative, for example, um, in foster care because there's a criminal record, et cetera. So, um, so this was just truly just a snapshot of what we know from the data. And, and again, I think there's a lot more in all of this, but I would refer to those of you who want um, sort of more research information to go to the NE website or the Council State Government website. Um, and so let's. Um, I'm going to try to go ahead and turn sort of the big picture, if you will, to my colleague Deanne, who's going to come to the reality of, okay, that's the number. Now, what do I do? I'm a service provider. I work in the community. Well, how do these numbers influence my day-to-day -day activities in trying to make a difference in helping our families? So, Deanne, you now have the ball. Thanks, Yali. And again, I want to say to all of you, thank you for participating in this webinar. And that indicates to me there are many, many people out there that are very interested in serving and uh, improving responses to this population of children. Um, I'm going to begin with the most um, important protective factor that we can offer this group of children that often care, carrying the greatest volume of risk factors of any set of, among at-risk children, and that is the importance of maintaining parental contact. And it is both a practice and a policy issue. And uh, if you look at this from the child's lens, it is probably the, the critical issue for them. Uh, separation from a parent that you had a relationship with uh, brings with it a, a cascade of feelings. Uh, and because most of these feelings fall on the on the, the, the very negative range of the continuum, uh, they are having to cope with some of the most difficult feelings that you can have: uh, guilt, shame, stigma, fear of being abandoned, loss of financial support. Uh, there can be some really profound reactive responses on the part of children of all ages uh, in their efforts to try to cope with some of these very, very horrendous feelings. And that can include anything from uh, regression in, in their behaviors, their sleep patterns, their uh, toilet habits, uh, to an impaired ability to cope with future stress or trauma. Uh, we know that regular contact can decrease the negative impacts of incarceration. So in the Bill of Rights for Children of the Incarcerated, that is, is one of the singular uh, issues uh, when we're talking about policy and uh, corrections. And what we have to deal with are contact visits. Um, it is very important that children be able to touch their parents when they visit. And it's more commonly in our jails where we will not uh, have contact visits, but lots of prisons, uh, state and federal prisons, do bar touching or they restrict the child visiting uh, and the parent even though there's no glass between them, between touching. And I think we all know, any of us that have worked with children, know that um, that kind of contact is, is truly critical, not just for the infants and the toddlers, but also for the older children. And I have certain, I've had a teenager uh, in the visitation room sit in her mama's lap for four hours. That's how important it is. Um, the 
kind of uh, attachment bond we think about, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, is, is just critical for healthy child development. And it is a, serves as a protective factor not only for the, the young ones, but also for our older children. And we often forget that. Maintaining contact, contact helps normalize the experience uh, between parents and children, and it benefits the kids emotionally and behaviorally. A lot of children um, get to know each other in the visitation room, and that's kind of an important indication of the value that the children experience in having a peer support setting to talk and process in. Um, and when we talk about recidivism, you know, the reason that we want to maintain parental contact is primarily on behalf of the children uh, because it, it helps them fare during this time with a greater sense of well-being and security when they're having visits. But it also benefits on the recidivism side. Uh, we know that parents who have regular contact with their kids during the incarceration stage are less likely to commit another crime, and I've seen the figure as high as uh, six times less likely to recidivate. So um, if you can't persuade corrections on the one side, maybe you can on the other side. And there's also, you know, a tremendous value in the prison culture when you have the incarcerated parents able to have this kind of contact, and particularly child-friendly contact with their children. Um, the newest uh, component of reentry is really looking at how we can engage the family, uh, both during the, the stage of the parent's incarceration and also involve them in the reentry planning. There are so many minefields waiting out there that we know about uh, for a parent coming out of of prison, aside from the very basic issues of finding a job, a place to live, um, getting their identity back, et cetera, they also uh, are often coming home in, in one fashion or another uh, to reunite or reconnect with their, their children and families. The more recent and the more consistent the visitation contact has been and other forms of contact, the smoother the parent has. Uh, as a course of reentering the family, uh, both, as I said, reconnecting but not necessarily living with the family and, uh, and or reuniting with the family. If you come home to children that you haven't seen in three or four years, you are coming home to strangers, and they feel the same way about the parents. So we feel like it's a very important uh, protective factor for children. It's an important factor um, among criminal justice uh, providers, particularly in the correctional system, to see how we can further uh, manage uh, a more family, child-friendly kind of contact. And that includes the telephones where a heavy-duty surge charges sometimes make it impossible. And letters matter greatly. Uh, for children in the child welfare system, there is an interesting um, federal law in 1997 called the Adoption and Safe Families Act, ASFA, that has a fairly arbitrary timeline for children that are in foster care. We don't want them to linger there. So they, they crafted in the legislation a 15 out of the previous 22 consecutive months, the child has to be evaluated for permanency. Now, you can greatly imagine how many nonviolent parents are incarcerated that have a much longer sentence length than that. So um, the visitation during uh, the incarceration of the parent uh, with a caseworker is, is part of our law, our federal law, and it's not a choice. And we need to see more of those visitations taking place. And the real barriers there have to do with time and distance because our prisons are often sighted fairly far away from where their families are or uh, from the urban area so that a caseworker trying to uh, take a child to visit may be, you know, eating up the entire day in the visitation or even an overnight uh, trans uh, visitation transport issue. Uh, there are states right now who are managing to um, increase the, the time period to, for incarcerated parents to match up with the, the, uh, the typical average uh, nonviolent sentence length. 
and that's going to help greatly to salvage these families and keep the kids connected uh, while they're in foster care. In summary, uh, the benefits for children in, in maintaining these relationships with their parents who are incarcerated include it minimizes or repairs attachment disruptions, and that is critical. Of all the reactive disorders, an attachment, uh, attachment disorder can be the most serious and difficult to treat, and it leads to all sorts of poor mental health outcomes for the children, including, you know, all kinds of personality disorders and other kinds of difficult um, behavior constellations that, that really are distressful for the children and those around them. It also helps to correct the frightening or idealized images that children often carry with them about incarceration. And I can speak firsthand in that I had a child that visited um, through glass at the jail and became hysterical. And we took him to our local children's hospital. And the only way that we could really soothe this child, he was not, a, he was not an infant or a toddler, he was about a six seven-year-old, was to get the jailer to permit him to come downstairs and actually see that there were people handing out food, that it was a safe, it wasn't a dungeon, it wasn't a place where his mother was being uh, mistreated in any kind of way. And then you have the other, di you know, the other media that, um, like Oz, that children sometimes get in touch with that uh, bring up these frightening images. So we really need to be careful about how we portray uh, prisons and corrections to our children. The learning you're not alone is just essential, and it, it's sort of the reason that we need to provide more peer support uh, services because the children often feel like they're the only one. Now, the visitation programs that get made are often invaluable because that's another way of uncovering that you're not the only one and it helps to reduce, we hope, shame and stigma. It also serves to prevent the TPR, the parental rights, being terminated. And the role that it plays in healing and grief, the healing of the grief and the loss of feelings that are, are pretty strong uh, and, and difficult feelings to cope with is that we need to keep our eye on the more contact they have the less they are experiencing it as a loss or a grief um, process. And I believe very strongly that our role in, in this is to both help the children to heal through more parental contact and also to prevent them from enduring any further traumatization. And lastly, I think preparing for release is just essential to engage the children. Uh, they don't need to be forced into it, but I think it's something that needs to begin as a planning process and discussion with the children as to what to anticipate uh, when their parent comes home. Because uh, I, I've had children who expected their parents to return looking exactly like they did when they went in. And that's kind of a shocker if you haven't been visiting with them. And it's the same thing for the parent. Uh, when they run into children that are now two or three years older and have a whole new appearance, et cetera, if they haven't been seeing them, it's, it's quite um, startling, and they have to start from scratch. I uh, especially support in the Second Chance Grant involving children uh, in the reentry planning, uh, even if it's just a very small piece of it, uh, for them to feel some of the empowerment of being engaged in that process. The typical feelings that uh, are shared by children uh, dealing with incarceration of a parent or a loved one even is the fear of abandonment, of never being able to see their parents again, of being taken away from their caregiver. These are really serious fears that can be uh, exacerbated and become part of some really uh, serious mental health issues. Seeing their parents reduces the fear. The other components of that is um, how do you talk to your child about your sentence length, and I certainly work with parents who are going to be inside for a long time, and that's a very difficult thing to explain to a child that your parent may not be returning 
within their childhood. And um, I think we need to very carefully process that with parents and caregivers and then talk to the children about it. But it brings us back to the issue of what are you telling your children? And I think all of us in the professions feel strongly that um, we prepare a truth that is fit to tell based on developmental differences, but we don't conceal from the children um, the whereabouts of their parents. Uh, I have had children who have jackrabbit ears, and they know exactly what's going on, and they, they get further confused by the fact that people around them are lying. So then you get into uh, furthering the mistrust that may have already been birthed along with the incarceration. They worry. Uh, they also worry about their elderly caregivers, and their grandmas, and granddads, and the fear of their dying and not being able to uh, take care of them. I had one uh, grandmother come to me kind of baffled because one of her children said, you know, he asked me who was going to get the house, and it sounded sort of mercenary on her part. And yet he was really just trying to figure out you know, if, if I lose you, what's going to happen to me? Uh, and again, the issue around telling the truth, um, we really do need to be honest with the children. And the parents are particularly bad about that. They will tell them they're, they're in a factory or they're off working on a job. And, you know, the question still comes up, you know, well, how come you can't see me or be with me? Um, these typical feelings of sadness, uh, we need to take into account that these kinds of feelings will ultimately be about loss, and it triggers in a PTSD sense uh, the pains of previous losses. And very often there have been other episodes of incarceration uh, of their parents, and they may have you know, felt even more, more sad, uh, sadder at that point, and it just triggers uh, those, those previous losses. Uh, guilt, and I distinguish the guilt from the, from the shame the children often feel. The guilt is really feeling responsible for their parents' behavior uh, and suffer uh, the guilt of not being a good enough motivator to change their parents' behavior. Or just on a developmental sense, uh, when children experience two events occurring in the same space of time, they often assign a causal relationship. So I've had a child say to me, it's my fault because my dad told me not to drive beyond, run my bike beyond a certain point, and I did, and when I came back, he was being arrested, so it had something to do with me. And that's how children are developmentally. They do place themselves in the center. Um, caregivers may attempt to distract or protect the children from distress, avoiding conversations about the parents leaving the child. And again, that, that ends us uh, up with the children feeling very isolated and confused. And so it's very important to share with the caregivers uh, the value of, of being honest with them. Uh, the sex of stress and trauma, we're learning more and more about the role of cortisol and its effects on, on children's brains and adults' brains. But um, the, the kind of stress and trauma that these children experience is what Denise Johnson calls cumulative traumas, that they don't just have one trauma that needs to uh, have a recovery or healing period. They have multiple traumas that come on top of each other. The parent's arrested, the parent disappears, you can't see the parent, then the parent's sentenced, then they get taken away further away. Um, so there's just, there are all these cumulative things going on. Uh, and again, we talk about the separation and attachment disorders that can, um, be the response on the part of the children to uh, the trauma and stress they feel, uh, depression, eating and sleeping disorders, anxiety, um, attentional disorders that often get uh, diagnosed as ADHD when they're really reactive to what's going on with their parents, developmental regressions. Um, the behavioral issues are again reactive responses, um, physical aggression, acting out, disruptive behavior, uh, sometimes serious antisocial behavior or conduct disorder, violent or serious delinquent behavior. And I think, you know, again, we've got to help them craft their own uh, healthy coping mechanisms to uh, 
deal with the, the stress and the trauma, and we need to be minimizing the stress and trauma through the visitation process and contact. We also see children begin to do poorly in school. They're not paying attention, um, diminish in their uh, academic performance, and we do see a lot of truancy, and we need to be prepared for that and to try to address that through creating more protective factors. My famous story of a little boy um, that was being driven 17 miles by his grandpa to see his mom here in an Arkansas prison. Um, I looked up and they had finally gotten together and the mom was crying and I went over to her and I said, what happened? And uh, the little eight-year-old looked up and he said, well, I was just telling my mom that um, every night when I go to bed at grandpa's, I put some of her stuff, like some makeup or some of her shoes right next to my bed. And she was just sobbing and saying, why do you do that? And he said, well, Mom, you know, just for those few seconds, it feels like you're at home. And you, you, you have to go, oh, my gosh, this little fella has figured out a way for the moment to do a little self-soothing. And you have to admire that. But we need to provide more support for the kids to help them develop these kinds of uh, coping mechanisms. The stress points are important to, to know and to share with your, um, if you're a second chance grantee, you're working with a parent inside, they need to sort of have this little set of stages and stress points. Arrest is for a child a very fearful and confusing and even uh, panic reaction, uh, as I told you about the child that, that was inconsolable. Uh, the anxiety and frustration about the trial if there is a trial, um, children often, uh, you know, are very frustrated because they don't understand why they can't know uh, what's going to, what the outcome is going to be. And many, many times, uh, their parents will bring them to the trial in the hope that um, that will somehow um, mitigate some of the um, reactions of, of judges or prosecutors or such. And uh, I had a young woman that I worked with in the fellowship that told me that um, she was sitting there with the sentencing and her parent uh, was suddenly disappeared with the bailiff and was taken to the back. And she was just so startled because nobody had told her that the parent could just vanish like that. And uh, at this point, she was an adult and she got um, an opportunity to sit down with that judge and talk to him about how that particular process had impacted her in such a, a negative way. Um, the initial incarceration does elicit the feelings of abandonment and stigma and what we call the bind of loyalty because often there's tension between the caregiver and the parent who is incarcerated. And so the child gets pulled both ways. Um, we really need to be helpful to the parents and the caregivers in finding ways that they can work together to not place these children in that position. In the car incarceration at the second stage, um, the parents be begin to experience some of the resentment and difficulties that the children have about their, their being away and missing important milestones. And um, they often will stop wanting to visit during this period or letter writing will stop. So. Parents inside need to be prepared for some of these reactions of the children. The pre-release stage um, for families, including children and adults, uh, is accompanied by a lot of uh, fear and anxiety and also a lot of anticipation, uh, some of it uh, fantasy-like. And one of the things we need uh, to serve the families with is is to help them kind of stay reality-based about what's going to happen and to have that uh, carry over to the children. Multiple children I have served have talked about how they're going to do this, this, and this. They're going to make their mom and dad's life just beautiful. They're going to, you know, find a way to build them a new house. And you can hear all the fantasizing that's going on. And so then the letdown at release uh, when there's a great – deal with ambivalence and chaos, and, and there are other kinds of stages that the children go through. I, I call one of them the Velcro stage, where, you know, the last time 
mom went down to the store, she disappeared. So whenever mom wants to go anywhere, and oftentimes somebody that's just returned home would like to have a little privacy and alone time, the child will Velcro themselves to them. So that needs to be part of the anticipation and, uh, you know, really some thinking ahead about how to pursue that. I am now flipping the ball to Margaret. Thanks, Dan. So we have another question for all of our audience members out there. Um, we're interested in knowing which of the following populations you're currently working with. And shortly, a, you'll see the poll pop up on that right panel. So your options are uh, incarcerated parents, the children of incarcerated parents, caregivers of those children other than the incarcerated parents, or perhaps you're in a situation where you're working with more than one of the above. And thank you all who've been submitting questions as we go along. I can see there's a few questions that we have already planned to respond to in the course of the webinar, and then others we can get to during the Q&A period. Some of the questions that we've seen a number of have to do with requests for specific kinds of resources, uh, talking points for working with children and talking about the fact that their parents are incarcerated and that sort of thing. And you'll certainly be seeing some of those resources later in the webinar. All right, this is Sean, and we have the poll results. Um, it looks like 127 people on the line um, work with incarcerated parents. Um, 54 work with children of incarcerated parents, 19 work with caregivers of the children, and 245 work with more than one of the above. Thank you, Sean. So that's a great indicator that uh, we've got representation from sort of all three sides in this little cluster, and, and that many of you are working from a family-focused approach where you're working with more than one group. So let me turn it now back to Yali, who's going to give us some detail about ways that service providers are working with children of incarcerated parents. Thank you. Um, I want to say, because I was also kind of keeping an eye on the Q&A, that for this work, um, it's like social work, like all social work, we're not talking about black and white, we're talking about gray here. And so every parent-child caregiver relationship is unique, and every correction setting is unique. And so I hear people talking about, like, gee, the particular jail correction setting that I'm with, they're not very family friendly. Maybe the waiting list um, where people wait are out in the hot sun. Maybe there's, it's five and a half hours and you don't, I mean, there's a lot of reasons I think that a visiting program may feel not family friendly, not comfortable for the child. And what's important for service providers to remember is, is that because, does the child have a bad visitation because of the interaction with the parent or is it because of the visitation setting, because they had to wait in the sun, because of they had to travel this far? Because, and, and so this is where I know that this is for, this is a um, training and a webinar on tips, but it, it also means I hope that we're moving toward an advocacy movement, that we are trying to advocate for thinking of the children in these settings, that we understand so many of our families are there, that can we help improve the quality of the visiting rooms. I've seen visiting rooms are, that are absolutely horrible. I mean, just have to be frank. And I've seen other ones in which there has been a concerted partnership with service providers and corrections to have toys in the lobby, to really think about the kids and family, to make this as much as possible um, a comfortable relationship and time for the child and parent because they realize the payoff from their end on the corrections is an inmate that's much, much more motivated to do programming to not want to do lockdown, to be, I mean, this is sort of, I think we're all, and this is probably not the best way to put it, but we're sort of the carrot and the stick people are getting together here, in a sense. We have the correction folks, and we have the care people, the service providers. And for too long, we've seen these as disconnected, that we work in isolation, just like the, we have the adult program people, and we have the kids people, and that we don't necessarily see us working together. And the reality for the family is that they have to deal with all of it. From the service provider's point of view, we seem to separate it all. 
but they deal with all of it, and we need to talk and think about what that impact is from the viewpoint of the child, from the viewpoint of the grandma, from the viewpoint of the incarcerated parent that's going to come out. Because at the end of the day, they will get back together. And that experience, that crisis opportunity that we had to all work together could be either a good one or a bad one based on how we are able to see each other as partners or not. So not to get preachy to the choir here, but here are some tips that I've heard from folks that have had really good programs, and it didn't mean they started out that way. I mean, it took many of them many years and many sort of moving forward and back and trying all different avenues in their local jurisdictions to see how this works. Um, one is that the programs will treat the clients as staff and advisory members because they know that nobody knows better what a program means and nobody has credibility to the clients and the kids more than those that were there themselves. And that includes, um, and, and we'll talk about this in the resource section later, um, parent advisors, um, support groups for grandparents that, are, that have um, children, uh, they're taking care of the children of incarcerated parents. Um, they have them in different capacities. I know one of the biggest difficulties that programs often have is hiring somebody with a criminal record. And so sometimes they have to get a little creative about perhaps using AmeriCorps funds or using the nonprofit as a hiring agent or um, advisory members that are paid via gift certificates, et cetera. But the, the value of having that voice in a very integrated way from the very beginning of the program, I've heard, has been just so key. There's also a very strong non-judgmental holistic viewpoints from successful programs that the parent is going to know when they're taking a parenting class if the person doing the class is judging and feels like there's no hope. That 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 part of it, I know it's, it feels a little warm and fuzzy, but it, it's felt by the participant and the child themselves. And again, that's one of those things that if you have the client involved, I think, the judgmental component is less likely to be there. There's also the one size fit all, which is very tempting for us to do. But kids and parents and families just don't fit that easily and cleanly. So I know that some of the questions people ask is, what if there's a domestic violence issue there? What if this kid is older? Yeah. I mean, if you can't say easily. Your, your program's just going to have to adapt a little bit about what works. And there may be some relationship where it may not be in the best situation for visitation right at that period during that moment. But you have to think through the gamut of what does that mean? Does that make letters? Does that mean phone calls? Because what we heard from folks is when they come out, they're going to reconnect again. And during this crisis opportunity, what can we do to figure out who can get what they need at the various components and different parts during the incarceration period and post? Um, and again, many, many of the successful programs I know try to partner with the the, the resources they're going to need, and that includes the mental health component. Um, I know when we were doing work in San Francisco, we became very clear after we did more visitation work was that mental health need to be with us for not only the incarcerated parents component, but also the child. These visits bring up all these different emotions that Deanne talked about. How can we help that child be connected? Perhaps there's a school program, a community-based program, that they use that visitation and that interaction very much to link up to other things, um, other support groups, and using the visiting room for the brochures and the information. Um, and I've also seen programs that have, you know, we sign people up for food stamps right then and there, right in the visiting room, because we know grandma's going to sit there and wait, and that's a great time to help her explain and understand what's going on and what she needs. Because sometimes a lot of her needs are very basic, like, I need help paying for PG&E. I need to be on food stamp. I don't know and I don't understand this. And I am sitting here, in a sense, as a captive audience as much as the parent is. Um, some of the examples and where I think like, I refer to them, and I, and I think these are truly, you know, I see people asking questions of where can I, how can I. Um, and, and I think instead of talking generalities, I'd like to refer folks to successful programs or programs that have um, had a little more history doing this to see if that's helpful. One is this project called Project What, run by on the San Francisco Bay Area, where young people who have experienced parental incarceration um, develop curriculum and training um, for um, other young people, and as well as um, they do trainings and presentations to other audiences, like social workers, like teachers, like corrections, and, and it's so incredibly powerful. There's nothing like the voice of a client themselves talking about their experience. And there are also, this is the resource card they turn to all the time, because the young people um, wrote about 
things like jail visit. Like you should call ahead of time, make sure you dress right. Um, I mean, all the things that many of us may have learned the hard way about corrections. Um, and, and it also has a really powerful CD of the young people telling their stories. And that's available for free, or you can um, at this link here. Um, and to, you can either download or try to get the full booklet, which includes the, the, DV, uh, the CD of stories. Um, there's also the Our Children Women to Women Mentoring Program, which um, I know it's been a really powerful model where um, women pre-release are able to partner with those that have gone through the process. And again, I have the link to the website here. Um, and I'm going to go and throw the ball over to um, Deanne, who has um, her program has created a really powerful model, I think, for trying to create the conversation and dialogue among partners. Yes, um, I'm glad to share this with you, and I'm, I'm certainly what, you know, glad to do so in more depth. Um, long, long ago, I called Carol Burton, who is now the, the executive director of Center Force in San Rafael, California, uh, trying to learn as much as I could about how to best serve children who had been left behind to parents' incarceration. And she was using something called a co-parenting agreement. But I never got the details of it. So I just came away with just that concept. And I began to utilize it because I do a lot of work with kinship caregivers of these children, uh, support groups and all kinds of uh, services. And I kept running into what I mentioned before, the, the divided loyalties issue, because there's often a strain between the caregiver, and that could be the other parent. It could be a step-parent, uh, or it could be uh, a grandparent or a, another relative who may or may not be, you know, pretty frustrated with the parent who's now returned to prison, because very often that's the case. So in trying to, you know, work on what do we all call uh, children's best interests, I took this concept and what we do inside, I, I teach parenting and family development inside jails and prisons and, and community corrections and the federal penitentiary. And um, the document is something that I, I have the name of the caregiver. When the children have visited, um, we begin to talk about what what some of the divisions are, like they won't accept letters, they won't accept phone calls. Uh, and oftentimes the person inside doesn't really understand all the reasons for that. And sometimes it's not just being uh, ornery. Uh, it's that they don't have the, the means to accept those calls or uh, to be really uh, compliant with letter writing. So the model developed where um, I was able to work with the caregiver and the parent inside and begin to, you know, develop what, what would they like to see. Um, caregivers often want to know that the person inside, the other parent, or the daughter, or whoever it is that's um, at one time been the, the caregiving parent, uh, is really doing something worthwhile while they're uh, incarcerated, you know, taking courses, programs, that sort of thing. And they like to talk about how important that is to them. And on the other side, the parent usually wants to talk to the caregiver about contact uh, and other ways of working together because you know, often there are very different styles between, let's say, how a, a caregiver parent and uh, how a parent parents or, uh, you know, just that strain and tension between step parents or uh, a parent. Uh, a caregiver on the outside feeling like it's in the child's best interest to not have this communication. So we began developing with each side, each party, developing what they would like to see. And then we have meetings inside in which we began to, uh, to come to some consensus because none of this can be forced on anybody, uh, especially the visitation. If a child does not want to visit their parent, uh, a child should not be forced to do it. But if a child wishes to visit, there ought to be enough uh, compassion on the part of the caregiver to be open to hearing that, even if they would rather not visit. Uh, so we began to develop these um, co-parenting agreements. Some of them are very, very specific, very well thought out, and they are, they are um, 
in progress. They can be revamped, but they must be written. And we have even had the success of parents uh, returning home, and let's say there's a guardianship or some kind of custody arrangement, and there's you know an interest on the part of the other of the caregiver in um, eventually returning custody to the child. And we have had a, a few judges uh, around our state who have taken the co-parenting agreement and placed it into the custody arrangement because there's such thought that goes into it. And um, I think the more the parent and the caregiver have to think about this, then the more we can be assured that the child is at the centerpiece uh, of what the decision-making really is. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful that that's a good reentry tool as well. I want to mention uh, the National Resource Center on Children and Families of the Incarcerated. Um, it, it was um, birthed out of the, um, the old um, Federal Resource Center for Children of the Incarcerated and is now uh, under the uh, Family and Corrections Network that's been around for about 30 years now. And it includes all kinds of their website. I write the policy piece on their website and also the Bill of Rights for Children Incarcerated update. But there's plenty more on their website, and uh, especially a, a collection of papers uh, for each entity that might be involved with these families. Uh, I especially like the one that has to do with toddlers um, and how to, to really work on sustaining contact there. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, these are online, um, the one that my organization put together can be downloaded on our website, and um, it's borrowed in some sense from other, other kinship caregiver handbooks, but it's detailed for the state of Arkansas, but it's a good model for looking at, I think every state needs to have something to hand to the kinship caregivers about what assistance is available in your state. Um, Washington State has been a terrific leader in this field, and they have put out a, a, health, a behavioral health toolkit for children, working with children incarcerated in their families, and I, I, I highly tout that. And here again is another caregiver's guide uh, by the California Department of Corrections uh, done by uh, Friends Outside. I think there's some Friends Outside people on this webinar, uh, but it's an outstanding yeah, they also have one for children, too. I should have listed that as well by um, Friends Outside. So I know it's sort of like you need resources for all the different audience, one for the caregiver, one for the child. Sorry, Dan, I didn't interrupt. No, welcome you. Um, this is a recent issue on, on this page, the Children and Incarcerated Parents and Scholar and Feminist online issue. It is their first publication, and um, it's, it's an excellent publication. And um, I have an article in there on uh, the shackling on child birthing uh, issues in prison. Uh, but there are a multitude of worthwhile things to say. So there's the, the connection. Um, the second one, It's My Life, A Young Mother's Guide to Surviving the System, is wonderful and put on by the Center for Young Women's Development out in San Francisco. And you really need to take a look at it, especially those of you who may be serving uh, juveniles or, or young adults that are in the juvenile system. Um, and last and certainly not least is the recommendations of the Council of State Governments. Uh, there were a series of convenings and um, I was an OSI fellow and we really worked hard and, and put together um, this action plan and there's something like uh, 70 plus recommendations for improving outcomes, and I really encourage you to go to that website. And I am now flipping it back to Margaret. With the poll. Thank you, Dan. So this is the last poll for our webinar today. We, one of the questions we had was how much issues around child welfare involvement and immigration are affecting the families that you're working with. Um, so we have a couple of different options here and ask you to pick the phrase that best describes your experience, whether you're seeing most families have child welfare or immigration-related issues, um, 
whether the families are, are experiencing issues in sort of both areas or there's sort of one area that's really dominant among the families that you're working with. Um, so shortly the poll should appear on the right side of your screen. Thank you, Sean. So go ahead and select the action that is most similar to your experience. And we'll be spending the last part of our webinar talking about some of the particular challenges families are experiencing with the child welfare system and the immigration system. And then we'll spend some time at the end uh, addressing some of the questions that have come up. All right, Margaret, I've, I've got the results here. Great. Um, most of the families I work with have have child welfare involvement. That's the most popular answer with 138 of the respondents. The next one is uh, most of the families I work with have child welfare involvement, but few have immigration-related issues is the second most popular at 108. Okay. Um, followed by the, the final option, the families I work with rarely have child welfare involvement or immigration-related issues. We have 46 people selected that, and then the rest of the respondents were spread pretty equally. Thanks, Sean. So, huh? Yali, you know, given what we know of our audience, um, maybe they could spend some time giving us ideas of things that we should be keeping in mind when working with families affected by child welfare and immigration issues. Absolutely. This is helpful to know ahead of time. And I have included my email on the web um, in the PowerPoint. And so for those of you who do have immigration-related questions, I'm happy to answer those or have um, Sean and Margaret direct them to me because often those are individual cases. You may not get a lot of them, but some of them are very challenging. Um, so just something um, to know about when you're dealing with the child welfare population. And this comes um, from an excellent um, – uh, handout. It's not very long, but I think they do a really good job summarizing it um, from California, the Northern California Training Academy, is um, what can social workers do to help the children and their incarcerated parents? So I said earlier, I mean, I have here the estimates 10 to 20 percent. It's probably like it's somewhere between the 10 to 15 percent. Um, and one of the things that come up is that the ASPA issue, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which is a um, federal legislation that says a child who has been in foster care for 15 out of 22 months will likely lead to termination of parental rights. Um, and this is a problem for our population because many of the, primarily women, but also men, of course, um, are there, if they're there for minimum drug sentencing, it's likely that their time period will extend this, um, the asset time period. So you have these situations where uh, it feels like a catch-22 because the judge may order reunification, yet the parent is stuck in the corrections and may be doing, trying to do her treatment, but yet the clock continues to tick. And so it means that you're, the two systems are not in conversation, per se, and where a service provider can be most helpful in the conversation is letting both the parent and also the parent and the child social worker understand that you are trying to be helpful in um, creating the connections and, and letting people know what are their resources information. Um, it, it's very important. Parents don't know their, their rights necessarily, and, and the documentation piece is very important. And this is not to say that all parents will reunite um, or should be. You know, maybe, maybe that isn't in the best interest of the child. But it's the law and it's best practice that if the judge orders reunification, that the parent gets access to all those things they're required to during their period of incarceration. Um, and the resource I linked on this page will explain that much clearer. Um, of course, it is sort of a California document, so if you're in Arkansas, there will be slight tweaking because each state and county has slight different interpretations, but this is the federal law, and I'm sure if you show this document to your social worker, they'll understand it, and they'll understand the terminologies of where you're getting at, and also important for the parent to understand what that means. Um, 
I, I work with a social worker out in San Francisco jail, and she's being funded by San Francisco Human Service Agencies. And many, and she does special cases and visitations and help arrange it for the workers from the inside when they're trying to visit the child. And sadly, many of her cases are involving what she calls the goodbye visit. They do end up the termination of parental rights. But she, as a social worker, knows, and in talking with her clients and family, know that um, there are loss issues and that there are really big chances out that the family will reconnect later, even if there's a termination of parental rights. Even when the parents come out, they will still connect. And so her job is to try to do what she can to ensure that that process and that conversation and um, those closures, if you will, happen in um, as natural ways you can, considering the fact there's now two systems involved, both corrections and child welfare. Um, I, I go back to, again, many of the incarcerated parents don't understand their rights. Many social workers don't understand the jail and prison settings. Um, I did a workshop uh, last year for a group of third-year social work students, and I asked how many of them have visited jail, how many of them have a contact I even know about our California prison system, how much do they teach that in school, and there wasn't as many as we like. And, and that's something that I think we as a uh, child welfare institution have to understand, that the workers need to understand corrections and what that means, because their families are depending on them to understand what that means. Um, and that also they have a role in terms of the transportation issues and the barriers that can impact the child and the parent connecting or knowing about each other or knowing about their rights. Children are often placed and sibling groups are placed separate from each other in farther distance and the social worker may be the only link. And so again, you as the service providers can be a very important voice for a disconnected population. And, and, and also, like I said, it is the law. Unless there are cases where the court clearly says that this is not a family that are unified or there's safety issue in the family or there's uh, it's not in the best interest of the child. For many, many cases, the, the family is has been told by the court that unification is traffic going, and yet the parent is not receiving those services that the court mandates. Um, there's other issues, of course, the issue of establishment of paternity for fathers, which is very important because the father may say, this is all happening, and I, you know, I don't have a voice. Well, the worker can't do anything if, it has, if your name isn't on the birth certificate, if paternity isn't established. And this also comes into issue with the child support and other components. Um, one of the things I'm trying to work on my toolkit is, because this toolkit is written specifically for child welfare agencies, is um, there are things that child welfare agencies and social workers can do and help facilitate the process of um, connections that, that helps a lot during this crisis opportunity. One of the big ones is, for example, um, when the child is in child welfare and there's a child support issue, the father can be deemed for something for um, – there's private charges and there's public charges. There's charges that um, – where the father is helping pay the, you know, the grandparent or the wife or whoever is helping care of the child while he's away, but the government may be taking care of that child. And I've heard of these horror scenarios of a father – leaving the jail and prison and getting dinged with a huge bill because their child was in, in foster care for three, four months, not knowing that at the period of um, incarceration, they could have gone to the courts and had those fees waived or reduced or, or eliminated. And, and those are things system to system we can work on, um, but only if we, the father, the child support agencies, the social workers, and others understand that it's a possibility. Um, I've included some of the links to samples of jurisdictions that have done work in this area, specifically for um, those of you in child welfare or those of you who are connected with child welfare agencies. And this includes New York City's um, very innovative SIP program that's been doing transportation services to incarcerated parents. Um, includes San Francisco Human Services Agencies that have enhanced and reviewed a lot of their policies and procedures. Um, a description of it, like I said, it's on this website here. If you'll notice, many of the resources have a www.f2f.ca.gov. I've been posting a lot of material on children of incarcerated parents through our partnership with the California Department of Social Services. So as you're clicking on these different things, you may want to go back one page and see, a, look at some of the other resources that we posted and see if they're helpful for your work. Um, and then finally, Washington State Department of Social and health services has um, an online training geared for their child welfare staff 
which I think has been tremendously helpful and um, it's a really good example for those of you to consider. Um, other tools, um, RISE, a magazine for, by and for parents in the child welfare system. In this special issue, they specifically talk about parents in prison who try to stay connected with their kids in foster care and try to be unified. And then this really helpful parent manual about knowing your rights and responsibility by legal services for prisoners with children. Um, this manual is also available in Spanish on their website. Um, for the immigrant population, since there isn't as many on this website, I won't go into it very much except to say that I know many jurisdictions are having increased um, formal agreements with uh, Department of Homeland Security at where the incarcerated individual will serve their sentence and then be likely to be uh, deported. Um, and because many immigrant families have mixed status where the child may be a U.S. citizen, um, we find that that's going to, the child welfare system may be in play. There may be issues of where the child may go after the parents deported. And so it's, it's tremendously helpful for social services agencies to have relationships with the immigrant community so they understand what's the practice happening as well as where to get information about, um, about where the child, parent, and family, and caregiver can go to for um, credible information and connections. Um, we, we clearly don't expect everybody to be an uh, immigration legal um, attorney, but there are resources like your Catholic Charities Clinic um, who can be helpful, and I've listed many of these in this next slide, some of these links, including a, a toolkit I wrote with the American Humane Association specifically for social workers working with immigrant families, and on that uh, toolkit includes many, many other um, resources available, um, including legal resources. So on that note, I will hand the ball right back to um, Margaret and to see where we're at in terms of time and Q&A. Great. Thank you very much, Ali. So there have been a couple of questions that I've seen multiple versions of, so I want to start with one of those. And Deanne, I was wondering how you respond when wardens or social service agency staff or others are asking about how likely it is that children might follow in their parents' footsteps were they to visit them in prison. Um, some people have framed it within, you know, would visiting an incarcerated parent have a negative impact on a child's development? Um, and so I was wondering if you could respond to that question. I, I certainly respond with a, a protective factor issue that the visitation is a positive thing. Uh, the children do need to be prepped, and they do need an opportunity to process the visit afterwards. But um, I think wardens that have experienced more child-friendly visitations are reporting back to us all over the country that it, it is an improvement in, in the, the behavior and the culture of the correctional facility but it is also the stabilizing piece uh, for the children. And I do not think anyone has the data to connect visitation with your parent in prison to um, future incarceration. And in fact, we're often uh, worn down by an old stat that is simply uh, not well uh, validated and is not reliable in terms of children being you know, seven, I've even heard it eight times more likely to go to prison themselves. Now, there's no question there's an intergenerational incarceration cycle going on, um, and these kids may be more vulnerable. So, so are all foster children. They're more vulnerable to going to prison as well. And I think we can, the common line we can draw is, is um, these are kids that may have not had stable uh, relationships with their parents. And, and that's really, you know, closer to the truth than, than depriving them of the relationship with the parent in prison. Uh, so I, th I think we're going to get more data that's even more confirming uh, the value of the visitation for the child. And I, I will celebrate that because we have a lot of therapists, we have a lot of the judiciary that are saying just what was in that question, and we need to uh, better educate them as the data starts rolling in. Great. Thank you, Deanne. Um, 
Another question that came up several different times is what are strategies to help the incarcerated parent if a caregiver is refusing to bring the child to visit? And what are some ways that um, someone working with the, that incarcerated parent might help them during that very stressful period? Now, if, really, if you want to respond to that as well. This is Deanne responding without being asked. <laughs> um, I'll just chime in on that and Yali too, but um, you may really have a caregiver that's, that's pretty entrenched and, you know, it does not want the child to be in connection. I, you know, I think there's a role for the community uh, agencies to, you know, help educate the caregivers about the value of, of visiting with their parents. But if you really have a caregiver, you know, a dad or stepmom, et cetera, who's really recalcitrant to it, then I think what I, I – the strategy I use with the parents, because it's so critical, is that they continue to buy uh, little money orders, even if they don't have many, you know, much money on the books in, in the prison, but send money orders to demonstrate their willingness to help to whatever extent they can. And to continue to send letters, and uh, if the letters start piling up and coming back, to hold on to them. Because I have many occasions where the parent and the child have reunited, and the parent was able to bring forth the letters to sort of confirm that, well, fully confirm that, that they were thinking about and caring about their child during that time. Yeah, I mean, from the child welfare perspective, because we have obviously many kids that are placed in relative caregiver, and um, I know the social workers, when they talk about it, they have to find out the root cause of why don't they want to visit. It's an issue of transportation and the fact I've got two other ones I have to take care of. So who's going to deal with the child care costs? Or I'm just, I mean, I'm really tired. This is one more thing. And so if it is a court mandated thing, then the child welfare agency can pay for some of the transportation costs perhaps, again, it depends on each jurisdiction, or the social worker can do the transportation. Um, it, there's often many reasons why there isn't a visit happening, and, and to try to figure out exactly what that means. And then also, perhaps letters are the best way to start first, letters and phone calls before you move to the visit phase of it. It's, it's not zero-sum. There's different areas of connections and how you make that connection. A letter doesn't cost very much. It's just a matter of if there's um, the will to con keep that connection going. And I always say that I mean, parents incarcerated, they get so cut off from the realities of the world that they really need to be uh, informed about the cost. You know, the, the last summer when we had the really high gas cost, uh, visitation fell off greatly. And uh, you know, it was hard for the parents inside to understand that you just can't whip out that kind of money uh, to drive that far or to stay overnight. Uh, and so there needs to be this flow of information that helps the, the parent and the caregiver better understand one another uh, and what the conditions are. Uh, but most of all, to help them come to a point where the child is really the focus of what's going on, not, not what their past issues are. One other question I wanted to um, be sure to bring to this larger group is the one about whether there are model police protocols for dealing with children at the time of arrest. And I was wondering if either of you could give an example of a jurisdiction that's done this well. Well, we um, both just did a, a webinar together on that. Oh, yeah, we posted it, actually. So yeah. there you have it. Yali, do you want to take this one? I could talk a little bit, and then I'm going to bounce the ball back to Deanne as well, because I know that one of her Bill of Rights uh, projects with the 14 states involved this. Um, so uh, the time of arrest issues, uh, there have been jurisdictions that have passed bills. California, for example, um, five years ago passed a bill by Nave, which um, you could say require, but it's still not binding, that uh, child welfare agencies and police jurisdictions have conversations about what to do at time of arrest because this is a very traumatic incident to the child and it may have some unnecessary triggers and unnecessary trauma that children do not necessarily have to go to the shelter 
if they, um, the parent's given additional time at the rest period to make phone calls and arrange their own child care arrangement, um, that children could be in a safe setting instead of child welfare unnecessarily, that children don't necessarily have to be transported in police cars to places, which is very traumatic for the child. If there was perhaps the grandma to come pick them up at the time of arrest or the social worker could pick them up in a normal car. Um, so I know in California, for example, we have legislation. We have a video produced by the, um, the police department by post police officer standardized training written by and for police departments, uh, written in short segments specifically for during the uh, roll call trainings that they do during the day. So there's short segments and it sort of walks through best practice. Um, I know police departments can ask for those. Um, even if they're outside of California, for the California Post to share that with them. The hard part is that none of this is binding, and police departments don't have to do these things, even though those that have done it, and the one I think of specifically that's been the most dramatic uh, and implemented the most um, fully, Santa Clara County, uh, San Jose, California, have found it to be very helpful for the police officer, for the social worker, and this is the one in this budgetary climate everybody is crazy about, it saved the county a ton of money. <laughs> I mean, it really, really did. Because what had happened is that as a result of it, it almost took them two years to fully implement this, um, is that police officers um, need, have a social worker located in the death station. When there's a call involving a child, the uh, police officer would have the social worker there at the time of arrest, um, in a safe place, obviously. Um, that the parent is given, again, the opportunity to arrange their own child care, that the social worker is able to make the phone call to ensure that that placement is a safe one, and that either the worker or the caregiver comes and gets that child, and they found a 50% reduction in their shelter intake. And, and that's just huge. It's huge for the child to be at grandma's instead of having to be a shelter with more strangers being transported in a police car. The police officer who doesn't want to be a social worker, the police officer would like this to be do what he's supposed to do and then have other professionals work on that component of it. Um, and, um, and and also they were grateful for it because the parents themselves found when there was this when people were all thinking about the child that um, not all of course but many of the rest flow smoother when they realized that we were all trying to do what was in the best case scenario for the child. Um, so this is the California example I'll bring up, but I'll let um, Deanne bring up one from many other jurisdictions that are all very much focused on um, something very tangible we can work on together. Actually, if yeah. I could just jump in there, um, I think that's a, that's a great example, Yali, and, and one of our other webinar participants mentioned that New Mexico has also oh, yeah, have a great some example. of our protocols. So it sounds like there are a number of jurisdictions that can be helpful in um, – in providing models for how, how this can be addressed. Um, right. We've, one, we've got New Mexico, Arizona, Pennsylvania. Um, it's going on. It's just sort of catching on all over um, because it's something you can do administratively with training. Um, Deanne, could you give us an example of a jail or another short-term facility that has figured out how to work with children of incarcerated parents even in the course of those shorter stays? Well, I'll give you one really exciting example. You know, Cook County Jail in Chicago is one of the uh, most massive and, and almost one of the largest mental health facilities in the country, if you can imagine. And their women's uh, jail has, you know, it, they've begun to carve out um, a very, uh, it's a small selected group of women where they have contact visits. And I have to, I cannot underscore how amazing that is, that we are actually having a jail of that size um, providing opportunities for contact visits between mothers and children. Now, they are selective about it, uh, but it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And then in Pittsburgh, in Allegheny County, um, the community has come together in this very thoughtful, methodical fashion and created um, their, their county jail, uh, a, a child-friendly waiting area that is 
just amazing with volunteers, and they still have contact visits, so they're, they're sort of telephone. Yeah, I was going to mention Pittsburgh, actually, because I was just there um, last year, and I just have to commend the warden and the community. When we talk about family-friendly, I mean, it's the tone when you walk in, and there's half of the room was developed in partnership with the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh, and so they have interactive display. That is the display at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh has the most attendance, as you can imagine. And they have a volunteer there who does arts and crafts with the kids. They have, um, or actually I think it's a staff, it's either a volunteer or staffer with the, um, the Pittsburgh jail. But, but they also have somebody there who's um, helping answer questions about food stamps, about TANF, about housing. I mean, it's clearly from the perspective of this is a crisis opportunity and we're going to work together and make this a time in which we could benefit the clients. It's really powerful. They also have a free video that where they interviewed the dad about how their incarceration has affected their children and how they really want to do better and use this opportunity. And I think that's very powerful, you know, having the dads talk about it. And, and that, that's available for free for anybody who goes on their website. And we've actually got three law enforcement people. I mean, one, the warden of that jail, uh, Warden Rustin, and then we've got Kathleen Robinson, who's with the sheriff's office in um, uh, Tucson, Arizona. And Tucson's another place that has really implemented arrest protocols. And uh, we've got um, Captain Ash. She's still a captain out in California. If you want, you know, folks who are really correctional people talking about the amazing changes in the culture uh, by, by having children as a focus and having their parenthood as a focus, uh, and how it has it is changed the atmosphere. You know, those are three great speakers who can talk about it. Um, yeah. It's, and it's I know folks will feel like there's a lot trying to hold, help the whole system, but sometimes it just means one police captain, one warden, one jail, you know, one program is enough to make a big difference. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you for those examples. Rookie. So I want, as we approach um, 3.30, at least on the East Coast, I want to just mention a few housekeeping things. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for participating and thank Deanne and Yali for taking the time out today to share a lot of their wisdom and information with us. And to also thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for sponsoring this event. Um, for those of you interested in this topic, you may be interested in another webinar from the Family and Community Committee in conjunction with the Juvenile Justice Committee. It's going to be on October 4th, and we'll focus on family engagement strategies for juvenile justice. Um, you can learn more about the Urban Family Justice Program's work, as well as hear from some representatives from California's Division of Juvenile Justice about how they're addressing family engagement. And details will be forthcoming through the Reentry Resource Center. Um, for those of you who have questions that haven't gotten answered, and I know that that's a large group, feel free to follow up with Sean Rogers from the Reentry Resource Center. Um, his email is srogers at csg.org. And if he can't respond to your question directly, he will pass that on to one of us who will be happy to do so. Um, and lastly, when you leave the event, you'll get a brief survey on the webinar that will pop up on your screen and the Research Center would really appreciate your feedback on the event. So thank you so much, and this will conclude our webinar.